Well, here we are on the morning of February 3rd, 1946, on this far off Pacific paradise, over 4,000 miles from San Francisco. There are only 167 human beings here, 60 of them children. From the coconut palms, the pandanus and breadfruit trees, they get food and the material for their dwellings, of which there are only 26. They depend on their own arts and crafts. They are proudly self-sufficient. They are astonishingly intelligent. They are a gentle and lovable people. Yes, life is simple and beautiful on Bikini Atoll until today, February 3rd, 1946, when there enters into Bikini Lagoon a fateful thing, a grim, huge symbol of civilization in its most terrifying form. Arriving as Commodore Ben H. Wyatt, United States Navy, with a startling request. Will the people of Bikini abandon their paradise so that the United States can use it for a certain experiment with the fantastic, the incredible thing called the atomic bomb? essential crew away from this. We also I'm grateful to be here. I've been the uh, skipper of this vessel uh, for a couple of months now. You know, this is a very small vessel with a big mission. Uh, the wind is calm now. What we generally get is we get that westerly flow. and it's, it's In San Diego, I'm retired, and uh, we've got a two-year-old grandson. And whenever I think of him, I think of the future that we're going to leave. And, uh, I've got to be involved in this. We've got to leave a better legacy than what we've got going on right now. I got involved in peace work in 2006 at a time when I didn't even know there was such a thing as a peace movement. But I met my partner and I asked him, what do you do? And he said, I'm a peace activist. So that same year we both joined Veterans for Peace. He's a veteran. Uh, my partner Helen and I uh, have been involved with it for the last three years. We've been trying to bring this, the whole mission into fruition and uh, quite successfully. We have a huge uh, family of people who've crewed the boat and people who've organized the events and people who are supporting us in various ways. One of the five principles, founding principles of Veterans for Peace is to end the arms race and ultimately seek the elimination of nuclear weapons. This boat is an icon for that because it represents a different way of thinking about how to do protests. You know, the original folks who uh, did the protests uh, were not making any traction. So well, they came up with the idea of how can we grab public attention, and that is, let's get a sailboat, sail it from Los Angeles to Hawaii and then to the Marshall Islands, and let's cause a disruption of the nuclear testing that's going on in the Marshall Islands. August 6th, 1945, the first atomic bomb ever to be used against people was dropped on Hiroshima. And August 9th, again, on Nagasaki, a different kind of bomb was dropped. At the time, Albert Bigelow was in the Navy. He was a 30-year Navy captain. He was in Pearl Harbor at the time that these bombs were dropped. And it was so horrific to him that he quit his Navy commission a month before he could have retired with full pay out of protest of the dropping of the bombs. His family, a Quaker family, later hosted the Hiroshima maidens who came over to New York for plastic surgery, reconstructive surgery, so that they would be in less pain and could lead a more normal life. The United States continued to develop newer, bigger, better bombs, and there were a whole series of atomic bomb tests in the Marshall Islands. They were producing elements that don't exist in nature. One of those elements is strontium-90, it acts very much like calcium and it was blowing all over the planet. And because it acts like calcium, it was getting into our baby's teeth and bones as they were growing. They were getting into mother's milk and cow's milk 
and women were testing their milk for radiation before they would feed it to their children. So because of all of this and the major concern about radiation poisoning in our atmosphere, a group of Quakers decided that they wanted to do something about it. And they started the way you would normally start to try to change something. They wrote letters to the editor. They wrote op-ed pieces. They demonstrated in the streets. They wrote to the president. They tried to call their members of Congress. They did everything feasible to try to stop the nuclear bomb testing. Ultimately, they weren't successful then, and they decided they needed to escalate in their tactics. So they decided to get a boat and sail it into the testing zone and just put their lives in the way of the nuclear bomb tests. So Albert Bigelow bought the Golden Rule and sailed it out of San Pedro near Los Angeles. Really, it's a dream come true for me. It's a dream come true to be able to be a part of this movement that uh, began before I was born, and now I'm able to use what skills I've, I've obtained over the course of my years to engage in uh, resistance to the abomination of nuclear war and war in general. We want to help the public understand that there are other ways to deal with potential conflicts with other countries than to declare war or even threaten war or even for our country to be constantly preparing for war. We spend over half of the, the IRS income tax dollars on war. War is so nonsensical to begin with. It's just, it doesn't solve anything. It always ends up we have to be talking in the end and why not be talking in the beginning. It's just a proliferation of the military industrial complex, which is what Eisenhower warned against. It's taking all of our money away from our schools and our health care, things of great importance. Yeah, well, I think the Pacific Ocean should be living up to its name because Pacific means peaceful. So I would like for this to be the Pacific Ocean. What's happening is that all the nuclear powers are developing their nuclear weapons, and the U.S. has recently committed itself to a trillion dollars over the next 30 years to modernize and actually create some new nuclear weapons that are smaller, more tactical, more usable. To make the possibility of a nuclear war even more thinkable is what's happening right now. They maintain that they need nuclear weapons for their whole security strategy, but you know, what kind of strategy is that? Mutually assured destruction. And the very real threat of a nuclear war between North Korea and the U.S. with uh, our uh, President Donald Trump threatening to totally destroy North Korea. Of course, North Korea promising to respond in kind. So it's a very, very dangerous situation right now. This is semaphore. This is the letter N in semaphore. This is the letter D in semaphore. So it's nuclear disarmament. And that is the, uh, the sign that evolved, the peace sign. As we sail on our voyages, we've had three years now, it's mostly on the West Coast, and we're always running into people who are either new people on the crew of the Golden Rule or on the sister ship, uh, Phoenix of Hiroshima. So there's a lot of history there. We run into like Quaker activists who say they went to their first demonstration when they were seven years old when their parents took them to a demonstration to free the crew of the Golden Rule. So they got to Honolulu, they resupplied, and they were headed to the Marshall Islands. Well, the Coast Guard cutter brought them back. And they ended up putting the members on trial and convicting them of a number of violations that were ultimately thrown out. So that attracted nationwide attention and worldwide attention, ultimately. During their trial in Honolulu, another boat appeared at the same dock, two slips down the Phoenix of Hiroshima, captained by Dr. Earl Reynolds, who had just spent three years studying the effects of radiation on children in Hiroshima. And they heard the story, and they attended the trial. And they were so moved 
by the bravery of these men that were going to put their lives in danger to stop this terrible arms race, they decided that they would take the baton and they would go to the Marshall Islands and put their own lives in the way. And when they got into the atomic testing zone, the Coast Guard caught up with them and arrested them and sent them back to Honolulu for trial. What that protest uh, started was a worldwide uh, protest against nuclear atmospheric testing resulted ultimately in the signing of the Partial Test Ban Treaty of 1963. It also spawned the uh, founding of Greenpeace and other activist organizations. Bigelow sold the boat, the Golden Rule. After the Golden Rule was sold in Honolulu, nobody heard from it for decades. And then in 2010, she was a derelict boat floating around in Humboldt Bay, and she sank in a gale. We're about to be in the air and sea show that the Navy puts on. When you bring the Navy warships and the warplanes into a city, what you're doing is normalizing war. It's a way to desensitize, especially our young people, but also the voters, to think that militarization of our country is a normal and okay and good and maybe even glorious thing. It blows my mind. I mean, the people aren't thinking about what this is doing to their kids. We're surrounded by machines of death and destruction. And everybody's running around like this is so cool and amazing. The government of my country is the greatest perpetrator of violence on the globe, to quote Martin Luther King. And so the air show is sort of a celebration of all that global murder and imperialism. We have to use the golden rule while we're here to show our resistance to that militarism. You know, I only wish I could do more. Now, I wish I had another lifetime that I could spend, but that's not the case, so I'm going to do everything I can to resist this anti-human, environmentally destructive, and morally defective military industrial complex as it expresses itself here in San Diego in the air and sea show. The boat disappeared, but we found it in 2009 in Humboldt Bay. Leroy Zerlang had his crew pull her up into his boat yard. He was going to burn her. So she faced a watery grave, then she faced a fiery grave, and then Humboldt Bay Veterans for Peace and Quakers showed up and they said, Leroy, we think we want to restore this boat. Could you give us a year in your boat yard? And we want to rebuild this boat. We went and visited the Golden Rule in 2011, and it was a wreck. We visited her again in 2013, and she was starting to take shape and look a little bit like a boat. They relaunched it June 15th, 2015. Then we took off July 20th. We stopped in 10 different ports of call. Our second seasonal voyage, 2016, we went all over the waters of Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia, where we were able to give 23 educational presentations. And this gives us a talking point, a point of attraction to communities that we go into to draw people in so that we can get the message that there is uh, no room, no place in the world for nuclear weapons. We're going to go dish out some peace today on the ocean. Run it up, run it up, run it up, run it up. There you go. Run it up. Run it up. Run it up. They grab us when we're young, man, because they can manipulate us. The brain's not fully developed until you're 25 years old. That's why they want you when you're about 17, 16, you know. Come here, sign, on the, sign down on the dotted line, man. We're going to make a killer out of you.
I joined the U.S. Marines uh, at a high school. I served about eight years. I served in Iraq for seven months as well, and that was eye-opening. Overall, like there are good experiences. I met a lot of good people and a lot of good friends that I still have. Um, yeah. But then there's other experiences, uh, and after a while, I just decided to, to you know, uh, get out and end my tour in the military. I was only in the military for four years, the early 50s in Korea. It took me a lifetime to realize what has happened to me because of that. And uh, I'm a very talkative guy, and I did not talk about Korea for more than 50 years. Yeah, I guess I'm not ready to like talk about that part. <laughs> yeah. When I flew back from Da Nang to Japan on a C-141 Air Force plane, I was flying with 200 caskets that were American military people flying home, and there were about three or four of us. And uh, we sat there for eight hours with all these uh, caskets that were there. And the thing that went through my mind was the tragedy that these families would have to face. Uh, their life would be alterably changed. And uh, right then and there, I thought, I can't be a part of any of this anymore, and that I have to do something to change it. I trained as a Special Forces or Green Beret medic, and uh, kept me in the States uh, long enough to have the opportunity to talk to a lot of veterans who were returning from Vietnam. These veterans have told me stories about atrocities that U.S. troops were committing against Vietnamese civilians in Vietnam. So that kind of sealed the deal for me. I said, there's no way I can be part of that war. I was in on the uh, illegal Cambodian invasion under President Nixon. I am a combat vet, and I was a door gunner on the way out, and uh, 10 months into it, uh, I uh, had a moral uh, decision of uh, not carrying a weapon and not participating anymore, and they uh, stripped me of my rank uh, and my medals. I was probably emotionally breaking down from a lot of the combat that I've been in. Two air crews came in, they always fly together. And they came back and they were patting everybody on the back and shaking our hands and I mean, these guys were really hyped up. And it finally came out, what happened was is one of them, they're coming back from a bombing mission and they had a 500 pound bomb left and they decided to uh, drop it on a guy on a bicycle. And the wingman who was flying behind him said it hit the guy right in the back. He said that was the best thing. That's when I got an inkling that this really wasn't about protecting anybody. It's a shame. Uh, we got a boat coming up on your starboard. Being ashamed of myself. So, uh. And being ashamed of my country, because we're not supposed to be like this, taking each other's lives over resources and, and, uh, and objects. I think uh, we bring a unique perspective. And look, at the American people usually honor the military. Whereas other people, they may say, you know, uh, that's just some sort of peace, Nick, I don't need to listen. But when veterans who have, uh, that our members from World War II to Korea to Vietnam to the current conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, people will at least listen to you. They may not end up agreeing with you, but they'll at least give you the opportunity to express their view. And I think that's what makes the position unique. 
I'll see you there. I hope you will. Come into the meeting. We'll all be happy to see you. <laughs> okay. It feels nice to be on here. It just feels more more in line with you know me and my spirit. He's 41. I'm I'm 70, and here we are, a generation of, of veterans out here on the water, floating for sanity in an insane world. <laughs> We've been specifically sailing in support of the United Nations Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which just passed uh, last month or so, 122 to 1 in the United Nations General Assembly. So it's a very exciting development. If you love this planet, you will sign this treaty. Nuclear weapon has always been immoral. Now they are also illegal. I'm really excited about the Nobel Peace Prize being given to the International Coalition to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. So what can you do to help stop the possibility of nuclear war? What we're doing about it is through education. You can join our team. You could be an author, a speaker. You can donate. You can get involved with helping organize events and helping other people. Well, the original mission of the Golden Rule was to take bold action to stop nuclear bomb testing, to stop nuclear war. And so we've decided to head for the Pacific, where the action is at this time. We're planning to go to Hawaii, where the crew originally went, to Honolulu, and they're also facing real uh, threat and fears of uh, nuclear war in Hawaii right now, where they've just resumed a whole statewide alarm system uh, for the event of incoming nuclear weapons. Then we're going to go on to the Marshall Islands, where the original crew was headed. The Marshall Islands continues to suffer from the results of all the nuclear bombing that was done. There's a very high cancer rate there. From there, we would head to Guam, to Okinawa, and it's from there that bombers are flying over the Korean Peninsula. Then we want to go to Japan no later than 2020, when they're going to be commemorating the 75th anniversary of the horrific U.S. nuclear bombings of the civilian populations in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If possible, we may even sail the Golden Rule right to the Korean Peninsula with our message of peace. It's time to sail this little boat across the Pacific once again to put ourselves in the way of nuclear war. The question becomes, who is going to lead the effort to eliminate nuclear weapons? Who's going to step up? Who's going to speak out? You know, hope is something, in my opinion, that comes about with the effort put forth by human beings. But hope in and of itself is uh, empty. When people are putting forth great effort, then there's hope.